Today we're going to be doing lesson 7.4. This is our last lesson that we're going to cover before we uh, quiz and test next week. So uh, make sure you're paying really close attention. We will do an in-class activity tomorrow in class that will help you practice this. But this is a very simple lesson, um, but there are a few key things that you're going to have to pay attention to, especially when we get to examples two and three. All right, so in this lesson, we're solving polynomial equations that are in factored form. Now, we have not learned to factor yet, but we are going to be learning how to factor um, in the next half of this chapter. So what you're going to see is you're going to see polynomials that have already been factored down. So we're going to work on solving them when they're already factored. Later on, we'll learn how to factor them first and then solve them. So the essential question today is how can you solve a polynomial equation? Now we've already talked about polynomials. We know there are different kinds of polynomials. There's monomials, uh, binomials, trinomials, okay, but they all fall under the umbrella of a polynomial. So the property that we're going to learn today is called the zero product property. Now this property goes into effect when an equation is in factored form and set equal to zero. When that is the problem, when the equation is in factored form and set equal to zero, we are going to set each term. Now remember, terms are the parts of an expression that are being added or subtracted. So we're going to take each term or set of parentheses. Okay, you can also look at it as a set of parentheses being a term. And we're going to set each term or set of parentheses equal to zero. And then we are going to have a simple equation that we need to solve, just like we learned to do back in chapter one. Now, standard form. Standard form means the exponents are in order from least to greatest. So we can see some examples of standard form would be an x squared plus a 2x, okay? x squared plus 5x minus 24. Those are uh, problems that are in standard form because the exponents are in order from least to greatest as we look left to right. Now, if you take x squared plus 2x and you put it into factored form, you now have x times x plus 2. So it is factored down and broken apart. It's turned back into a multiplication problem. You can see that x squared plus 5x minus 24 is factored to be x minus 3 times x plus 8. So again, that trinomial has been turned back into a multiplication problem where we have multiplied two binomials. So we're going to learn how to, uh, to do this, but for right now, it's going to be done for us. Now, the solution of a polynomial equation. So when we are solving these problems for x, we are finding what's called the roots and the roots tell us where the graph is going to cross the x-axis. So if we were to graph these polynomials, okay, the answers or the solutions are the places where your graph would cross the x-axis. So if the directions ask you to find the roots, you're simply going to solve the problem that is in factored form for x. And when you solve for x, you're finding the root or the x-intercepts. Now. Let's put this into practice. If we look at example number one, it says solve the equation. We can see that these problems are already in factored form. So all we have to do is set each term or set of parentheses equal to zero and solve these equations. So if I'm looking at letter A and I have x times x minus one, the terms would be considered the x and the x minus one. Each of those is a term. So x equals 0 would be our first equation, and x minus 1 equals 0 would be our second equation. Now, we can see that x equals 0 is already solved for x, so we box it in. We're done with that problem. But x minus 1 equals 0, we need to solve for x, so hopefully you've already done this, but you know to get x by itself, we have to add 1 to both sides. So x equals 1. That means if we were to graph this problem, the graph would cross the x-axis at 0 and it would cross the x-axis at 1. Okay, so the main thing about letter A is understanding each part of the problem. Each term, each set of parentheses gets its own equation. 
Now look at letter B. We have B plus 7 squared. And we learned uh, in 7.3 that this is a binomial that has been raised to the second power. This is a special product. This is a square of a binomial. But we also learned that b plus 7 squared means b plus 7 times b plus 7. So my question, is it necessary for us to write the same equation twice? And the answer to that is no, it's not necessary. So when we see a binomial that has been squared, it's okay for us to write one equation, set it equal to zero, and solve for the variable. So in order to get b by itself, we have to subtract 7 from both sides. So b equals negative 7. Now, I want you to take a minute, and I want you to work letter C with the people at your table. Hopefully, you all quickly recognized that there are three sets of parentheses. So you're going to have three separate equations to solve. We have d minus 2 equals 0. We have d plus 7. 6 equals 0, and we have d plus 8 equals 0. And I'm going to have to give us a little bit of space. Actually, I'm going to go back and write these just a little bit smaller so we can fit them all right here underneath the problem. So d minus 2 equals 0, d plus 6 equals 0, and d plus 8 equals 0. Now, to solve the first equation, I need to add 2 to both sides. So d equals 2, and we're going to box it in. For the second equation, I have to subtract 6 from both sides, so d equals negative 6. And for our third equation, I have to move 8 by subtracting it from both sides, so d equals negative 8. So this particular problem has three solutions, three roots. If we were to graph this problem, it would cross the x-axis at 2, negative 6, and negative 8. Now take a minute and work letter D with your table. Now we want to be careful on this one because it appears maybe at first glance that this one is kind of like letter B. It's the same thing, so we only need to write one equation. But notice, this is another special product. Everything is the same except the signs are different. So this is the difference of squares. This is two separate problems because the signs are different. So we set up the equation 2x plus 7 equals 0, and then 2x minus 7 equals 0. Now, so far in this example, we've been working one-step equations. This, or these, are two-step equations. How do we know? Because there are two numbers keeping the variable from being alone. So don't forget, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. We actually work all the way down to um, adding or subtracting. Don't, or, um, not please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. I apologize. Don't call me after midnight. Don't call me after midnight. So we actually work all the way down to the after where we're supposed to add or subtract and then the midnight where we're supposed to multiply or divide. So we're going to start by moving the 7 and we're going to subtract it from both sides. So we have 2x equals negative 7. And then, of course, we're going to divide both sides by 2. So x equals negative 7 over 2. And that's our first answer that we're going to box in. For our second equation, we're also going to move the 7 first, but this time we have to add 7 to both sides. So 2x equals 7. We divide both sides by 2 again, and this time x equals positive 7 over 2. So be very careful. If it is a squared binomial, you only have to work one equation. But if it's the difference of squares, you are still going to have two separate equations that you have to solve. Now, moving on to example number two. When we get into factoring in the next half of this chapter, one of the first things that I'm going to teach you to do is to look for a greatest common factor. Before we start to factor these uh, polynomials and break them down and turn them back into multiplication problems, we are first going to have to check for the greatest common factor. So we're going to practice that a little bit here in example uh, two. Without doing anything else, 
we're simply going to look for the greatest common factor. Now remember, factors fit into numbers. So we're looking for the largest number that will go into all the given numbers in the problem. We're also looking for variables that are common in both of our terms. And this one gets a little bit tricky because when we're actually looking for the greatest common factor uh, with a variable, we're actually going to take the variable that we see and pull out the smaller exponent. All right, so we're gonna go over this slowly, but let's look at letter A and let's start with the eight and the 24. Okay, we're always gonna start with our numbers is there a number that goes into both 8 and 24? And if so, what is the largest number that goes into both 8 and 24? Because I know pretty quickly that 2 is going to go into 8 and 24 because 2 is an even number and so is 8 and 24. But that's not the largest number that's going to go into 8 and 24. Okay, so I'm going to start working with the 8 and I'm going to start thinking of numbers that go into 8. I know that 8 will go into 8. I know that four will go into eight. I know that two will go into eight. So the question is, do any of those numbers also go into 24? I know two goes into 24. I know four goes into 24. And I actually know that eight goes into 24. So what is the largest number that goes into both eight and 24? The largest number would be the number eight. So I'm then going to pull that out. And I say pull that out, you'll see what I mean here in just a second. Now the next thing I'm going to check are my variables. Is there a variable that is common to both terms? Is there a variable that shows up in both terms? And we can very quickly see that y does show up in both terms. But the question is, are we pulling out y squared or are we pulling out this understood 1 right here? Okay. And with variables, while we're looking for the greatest common factor, we're actually pulling out the smallest exponent. And why is that? Because we know that both terms have at least one y in them. So we're pulling out a y. You can put the one, you can leave the one off. It doesn't really matter. But what happens is once we pull out the GCF, now we're going to start a set of parentheses because now we have to put back in the parentheses what we have left over. So essentially what we are doing is we are taking this original problem, the original term, and we're dividing it by what we just pulled out. So eight divided by eight is one, okay? You can put the one or you can leave the one off, it doesn't really matter. But then y squared divided by y. We already learned that when we divide powers with the same base, we essentially subtract the exponents. So the problem started with two y's but we pulled one of them out. So y squared divided by y leaves us with a y. Now we bring down that minus sign or we look at this as negative 24 divided by eight. So negative 24 divided by eight, we all know is three. And of course, y divided by y is one. It's the number one, it's so we don't need to put anything down. So we are finished. We have just factored out the greatest common factor and this is what we're left with. Now, I want you to take a minute. I want you to work letter B with the people at your table and let's see what you can figure out. Now, as you look at letter B, hopefully you started by looking at the smaller number. We have a four and we have a 24. So we're always gonna work off that smaller number when we're trying to find the greatest common factor because we know that 24 is never gonna go into four. But four could go into 24. And we find out that that is the case. Four does go into 24, and that is the largest number that will go into both four and 24. So we're gonna pull out the number four. Now variables, hopefully you notice very quickly that there is an X in both of our terms, so we're gonna pull out an X. The question is X to the fourth power or X to the third power? Because the first term has four X's, the second term has three. And hopefully you're picking up on the fact that we're going to actually pull out the smaller or the smallest exponent. So three would be the exponent that we have to pull out. So we've pulled out the GCF of four X cubed. Now we start our parentheses and we divide. Four divided by four again is one. You can put it or you can leave it off. And then X to the fourth 
divided by x to the third. If I subtract the exponents, 4 minus 3, I'm left with 1x. I bring down that plus sign, 24 divided by 4 is 6, and x cubed divided by x cubed is again that whole number 1 that I don't need to write down, so there is my final answer. I have factored out the GCF of 4x cubed. Now let's take this and put it into practice in example number three because example number three asks us to solve the equation and I've given you the hint to factor out the GCF first. So in the problems that we did in example one, everything was factored for you. Everything was in its simplest form. All you had to do was set the equations equal to zero. Well now we're going to have to pull the GCF out then from there, we're going to be able to set up our equations. So looking at letter A, tried to keep letter A simple, we look at our numbers and we have an understood what in front of this A squared? We have an understood 1. So if we're looking at the numbers to see if there's a GCF, we have a 1 and a 5. Well, 1 is the only number that we can pull out, and if I pull out a 1, it's not going to change anything. So whenever your GCF is a 1, there's no need to pull out uh, a number GCF. But what variable is in both of our terms? Well, we have an A in both of our terms, and of course, hopefully by now you're getting, we pull out the smaller exponent. We have an A squared and an A to the first, so we're pulling out A to the first. So in parentheses, we divide. A squared divided by A to the first is just A, plus, we bring down that plus sign, 5A divided by A, the a over the a is 1, so I'm left with just a 5. And of course, we bring down what we have not used. Now we see a problem that looks like example number 1. So we set each term, each set of parentheses equal to 0, and we solve. So a equals 0, a plus 5 equals 0. a equals 0 is done for us. It's solved already. So we just have to work a plus 5 equals 0, and we're going to subtract 5 from both sides. So a equals negative 5. So there's our two solutions. Again, two roots, two solutions. If we were to graph this problem, it would cross the x-axis at 0 and it would cross the x-axis at negative 5. Now letter B is a little bit tricky and you, you want to be careful because there's two or three problems on tomorrow's in-class activity where this is how the problem begins. And understand, if you look back at all the problems in example one, if you even look right back here at letter A, you cannot set up the problem. You cannot start pulling out GCF. You cannot start uh, solving these equations until everything is on one side and set equal to zero. So I'm looking at letter B and I'll tell you this, I'm going to leave that X squared term exactly where it's at because it has a positive coefficient. All right, this 4 is positive, and I do not like uh, leading coefficients that are negative. So if my x squared term is positive, I'm leaving it where it's at, which means I'm going to bring 2x over here. Now, nothing's changed. If I'm going to move a term from one side to the other, I've got to do the inverse operation. So if this is a positive 2x, that means I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides. Now, of course, it cancels over here, and since there's nothing else left on that side, I have to put equals 0. And I'm very careful on the left, because the only way I'm combining these is if they are like terms. Well, 4x squared and 2x are not like terms, so I'm bringing them down separately. I'm bringing down 4x squared minus 2x. Now, why did I bring down the 4x squared first? Because standard form. My problems need to always be in standard form. So that is largest exponent down to the smallest exponent. So 4x squared minus 2x, this is key. Remember I told you there was a couple things when we got to example three that were gonna be key if you were gonna do these problems right. And this is one of them. Everything must be on one side. It must be set equal to zero. And the side with the terms must be in standard form. Now, we're looking for a GCF, so I'm looking at my numbers first. I see a 4 and I see a 2. And since I always work with the smaller number, the question is, does 2 go into itself? Of course. Does 2 go into 4? Of course. 
So that means the biggest number that goes into both 4 and 2 is going to be 2. So I'm going to pull that out. Now I see in both terms there's an x, so I'm going to go ahead and put the x. Now I just got to decide, am I pulling out x squared or x to the understood 1 right here? And again, hopefully by now you're getting, you're pulling out the smaller exponent. So we're pulling out x to the first. You can put the 1, you can leave it off, it doesn't really matter. And then of course I start my parentheses and I divide. 4 divided by 2 is 2 x squared divided by x to the first is x to the first. I bring down that minus sign, and 2 divided by 2 is 1, which normally I'd say we don't need the 1. However, x divided by x is also 1. So if I put nothing, there's a, empty, there's a blank space there that we can't have. So since the entire term is going to simplify to a 1, I've got to make sure I put the 1 and then close the parenthesis. Now the problem is ready, and I set each term, each set of parentheses equal to zero. So I have 2x equals zero, and I have 2x minus one equals zero. Of course, to solve for the first x, I have to divide both sides by two, and zero divided by anything is zero. So there's my first x value. Again, 2x minus 1 equals 0 is a two-step equation, so I have to add or subtract first, so I'm going to add 1 to both sides. 2x equals 1. I'm going to divide both sides by 2, so x equals 1 half is going to become my second answer. Now, it might not be a bad idea if you are totally lost on this, uh, these last two examples. It's on YouTube, so go back to YouTube tonight, re-watch the problem. Um, you're about to get some practice questions that you, can, that you can work, and so if you are just totally lost, you're like, I don't get, I get the first part, but I just don't get the second part. Go back and watch example two and three tonight on YouTube, okay? Go back, watch, re-watch until it clicks, until you get it. Because tomorrow in class, you're going to be working on this in-class assignment where you have to work these types of problems. If you don't know how to do it, you're going to be lost and you're going to have homework over the weekend. So make sure that you have an understanding of example two and example three so that you are prepared for your in-class assignment tomorrow and you are prepared for your quiz on Monday. Now that is lesson 7.4. And I hope that you guys have an awesome rest of your day.